Thank you for attending this brief talk on the history and archaeology of voyage in UK waters um, as part of the Festival of British Archaeology. This talk presents the remains of a 19th century timber buoy uh, recovered during the recent dredging operations in the harbour as part of the Queen Elizabeth class carrier support programme. Wessex Archaeology proved provided retained archaeology archaeologist services for the dredging works, which were completed by Boscalis Westminster Limited, with project manager, management and consultancy from Royal Hoscone in DHV. The overall dredging project was under the control of the Defence Infrastructure Organisation for the MOD. The sort will try and place the timber buoy within a short summary of the development of both navigation and mooring buoys, and then looks at the specifics of Portsmouth Harbour and its approaches within uh, both branches of the Solent. It deals in most detail with the infrastructure in place during the early and mid 19th century as the dockyard and harbour is being heavily developed into an industrial complex. During archaeological mitigation for dredge work, dredging works to allow the Queen Elizabeth class aircraft carriers to berth in Portsmouth Harbour, sections of a large tin buoy with the exterior copper sheathing were recovered from the harbour bed. Over two metres in length with a circumference of over a metre, the buoy was made up of 16 double skin straight barrel like lathes connected to solid domed ends made up of tin timber balks. A sec in a second skin of more substantial timbers um, was present, as were five internal uh, iron rings between the two skins and the joints between, between the two skins, and the joints between pieces were corked to make the buoy watertight. Several of the larger end pieces of timber had race, mark race marks on them carved into them, um, indicating that they were pieces of timber that had been accepted into the dockyard by a shipwright. These race marks dated the arrival of the timber into the dockyard to the 1820s. But what sort of boy was this and what was its function? So um, we're going to have a quick discussion into the history of boys. The use of boys to improve na safe navigation in UK waters um, was enshrined in law by an act of 1565 concerning sea marks and mariners. This concerned the taxes of voyage and beaconage that were paid by ship owners and masters for ships entering or leaving a river or harbour. Previously, these had been the sole responsibility of the Lord High Admiral, although in practice, these payments were farmed out to a local proxy in many cases. Following the 1565 Act, the Trinity, Trinity House of Deptford Strand felt empowered to begin setting up a system of beacons on drying banks and buoys in suitable places within the channels of the Thames. Examples of these included barrel-shaped ton buoys and cone-shaped can buoys, which were in use from at least 1582 and were documented on charts by Wagoner in the 1588 Mariner's Mirror. And that's the images you can see there. The can boys were anchored by their point and painted black with pitch or tar. These boys were used to mark the port side of a fairway when approaching a port to the left-hand side of a fairway. Um, while the ton boys painted white were used to mark submerged or partially submerged rocks. The starboard or right-hand side of a fairway when going into port were marked with beacons with top marks of willow, willow withies known as urziers. By the 1590s, Trinity House was maintaining and relaying the vital Thames fairway beacons and buoys from their own funds, while the Lord High Admiral or his proxies were still receiving the payments for beacon, voyage and beaconage, which was starting to put extreme financial stress on Trinity House. In 1593, the Lord High Admiral, Lord Howard of Effingham, released, relinquished the offices of beaconage and voyage for the Thames, along with other facilities to the Crown, and grant, granted them in turn to Trinity House in 1594. Within this, the Crown confirmed that Trinity House was the, had the right to lay out further beacons and buoys across the whole of England, English waters, with the important Humber estuary falling, 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 falling fully under its control as well. Work on this system of navigation marks was completed both in-house and by subcontractors, so the uh, voyage on the Medway and its approaches was contracted out to um, Mr Ponnell of Stewed, Strood for £70 a year. Over the next century, Trinity House was active in laying new voyage, particularly around the important and complex navigation channels of the Outer Thames estuary, but also in other ports such as Southampton and Newcastle, as well as maintaining the existing system of buoys and beacons. Um, this map here, that's the North Kent coast, there's the Isle of Sheppey, that's the Medway, that's the Thames, that's Essex. 
and I think that's the crouch. Um, so it's actually got west to the north on that one, or west to the top of the screen, sorry. Um, letters between the Lord, High, Lord Commissioners of the Admiralty and the Navy Board during the late 17th century suggest that the Admiralty was still res responsible for some navigation buoys, particularly those around um, na naval anchorages and muster points. The NOR, um, a major fleet anchorage in Thames Estuary, received a marker buoy in 1688, with ships being directed to more close to the buoy for victualling of the fleet throughout the 1690s. The removal of navigation buoys to confuse a perceived enemy was also completed in times of emergency. Um, a, a letter of 1690 requesting Trinity House to quickly and quietly remove all buoys downstream of the Nore after the joint English and Dutch fleets uh, loss at the Battle of Beachy Head during the Seven Years, War, 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 Seven Years War with France, being an example of this. Similarly, Captain Brumfield of Trinity House com commanded a ship that removed all navigation buoys between Harwich and the Nore in June 1797 to prevent the new the Nore mutineers from carrying their captured ships out of the Thames estuary to an enemy port. This demonstrates how vital the voyage of safe channels in the Outer Thames had become to safe navigation. By the early 19th century, a full system of differently painted and shaped navigation buoys was in place. Um, a notebook compiled by he Captain Henry Bonham Bax, formerly of the East India Company, during his time as an elder brethren of Trinity House, details the position um, by latitude of longitude, water depths, and characteristics of each of these buoys, along with uh, a delicate water cow of each one. This notebook um, is in the Caird uh, Library at the National Maritime Museum um, and is possibly one of the nicest things I've seen in our coast. It's, it's really, really lovely. Um, the matte white and black matte black buoys are by far the most numerous that continues the tradition of the can and ton buoys, um, with these no longer, but they're no longer split between ton and cone shape, um, the cone having been fully adopted as a more rugged um, and hard wearing shape for long term sea exposure. Some cone buoys were painted in different colours, and these appear to have been the ones marking discrete obstacles such as sandbars, while droplet shaped buoys, sometimes with a staff and a ball on top, um, marked wrecks. Some sandbars were marked by um, black cone buoys with a similar staff and ball, as you can see with the spit um, uh, buoy in the top left there. So the Northwest Starbridge in the Solent, um, the Northwest Starbridge, Southeast Starbridge, No Man's Yet Land, and Peel boys are shown to be matte white cones, while the Southeast Middle, Horse, Dean, and Elbow boys are all matte black cones, um, while the Sand Head is a red and white checker cone boy. For the earliest charts, the earliest charts of Portsmouth Harbour or its approaches um, with navigation marks present. Um, is from 1785, and it shows a cone construction buoy at Martha Harbour um, marking the spit. The buoy, along with others in the Portsmouth approaches, are present within the uh, notebook of navigation marks compiled by um, Captain Bonham Bax, with the spit buoy having that uh, distinctive black cone uh, with, a, with a, a staff and ball on top, which is also um, demonstrated on the, on the chart quite nicely there. Um, if we have a quick look at Solar navigation boys, a mid 19th century Admiralty chart legend document shows from Admiralty charts that shows near 20 different symbols for um, different shaped and colored boys that were in use at that time before uh, a sort of consolidation of uh, boys into, into smaller numbers of, uh, of types. Um, this suggests that at this time, the main concern of the voyage system was to prevent confusion between different boys in, in similar areas, particularly where you have a large number of, of, sand, of sandbars and, uh, and obstacles as you do in the solon. Um, with the information um, of what the boy was marking remaining within almanacs and pilot books. Um, so pilots' knowledge of the multiple marks identifying the bars and spits within the solon in the approaches to Portsmouth would have been vital to ensuring the, the safety of vessels entering or leaving, leaving the harbour. Within harbours, um, smaller cone-shaped buoys mark shoals and other, other dangers, um, with these excavated examples um, being, uh, being, being found in the uh, former Admiralty dockyards at both Bermuda and Halifax. These are made of timber with iron banding, loosely similar to barrels, but with greater structural integrity um, and occasionally obviously also um, copper sheathed. Um, at HM Dockyard Bermuda, a dedicated boy-making workshop was present 
um, although this may have been due to the distance from supply routes of the dockyard. Um, they haven't found they have, haven't found a parallel at British dockyards yet, but they're likely that they definitely they would have um, um, existed. It's just there, there isn't a record of them. I have never find. Um, the structure of mooring boys, uh, even less studied than the structure of um, uh, of um, navigation boys. Um, very few examples remain, possibly due to the inherent risk of of being a mooring boy, um, being damaged by mooring vessels, um, and the fact that the majority depicted in paintings, engravings, and similar images, show them to be corked barrels of varying various sizes, and therefore easily re re replaceable and disposable. These illustrations show that some of the boys were clearly repurposed barrels, um, corked and then given ex ex external iron rings. There is a, another um, uh, engraving similar to that one on the top left um, of Portsmouth Docker that actually has a uh, one of the barrel boys which has port, uh, a plaque on it saying Portsmouth Dockyard. Um, so it may well be that it was built within the, uh, the dockyard itself. Um, it's clear that the now Admiralty was involved in the laying of mooring boys within major anchorages where its ships mustered, such as the downs inside the um, Goodwin Sands in Kent uh, and the Nore on the Outer Thames estuary with um, letters from 1695 requesting 10 boys to be sent down to naval vessels in the downs. Um, these may have been on board supplies, however, um, but it could well be that they are actually um, needed for um, for mooring within those uh, anchorages. Um, after those examples, we again turn to Bermuda. Um, dockyards also clearly manufactured boys for use both um, on board ships and uh, for use within the harbours and uh, anchorages used by the Navy. Excavations on the infield moat of the Royal Navy dockyard in Bermuda during the 1980s recovered a series of navigation and mooring boys from the late 19th century, which demonstrate the function, functional and physical differences of these two categories. The mooring boys examples um, from the excavations of Bermuda show large barrel shaped boys, um, variously of timber, zinc and iron, um, with, with the timber um, with iron, with uh, having copper sheathing over the top as you can see in that example in the middle there. Um, and these are clearly large two to three meter size um, sort of boys. And that, uh, that sheathed example there looks very similar to uh, the uh, example we've got in, um, from Portsmouth. So we've discussed the types of boys that would have been in use and where certain shapes and colorings would have been most likely to be found within harbors and their approaches. Now we turn to uh, Portsmouth Harbor itself. Um, this Portsmouth Harbour and its approaches may well be the most heavily charted piece of UK, uh, part of UK waters, partly due to its importance to the Admiralty and partly due to its easy accessibility for young officers, trainees to be navigators and hydrographers. This means it's possible to look at the development of the harbour as a naval anchorage and the adaptions and technology that allowed it to safely contain the formidable numbers of ships for the Royal Navy. The earliest chart in the UK HO archives in Taunton is of Portsmouth Harbour. Um, dating to 1625, and this is a, a section of it, a slightly poorly reflected photo. Um, but again, you see, you see the north of Portsmouth Harbour is to the right hand of the screen. Um, this is the entrance here. This is the Solent through here. That's Gosport. And this is that's Port, Port Chester, Port Sea. Um, it clearly shows, while it hasn't got any voyage um, on the chart itself, it clearly shows the early development of the, of the Royal Dockyard and the beginnings of the utilisation of the large tidal, tidal harbour at Portsmouth. Um, a plethora of charts dating to the early 19th century exist, either made officially by na naval hydrographers or as gifts, exercises or aids to promotion by aspiring officers. A chart within the National Maritime Museum collection dating to 1785 uh, demonstrates that the moorings were generally of two types, swinging and head and stern bridle moorings. With the latter, more generally found in the upper parts of the harbour in the creeks around Whale Island and in Port Chester and Bombaketch Lakes. The former were, more, were generally um, located within the main north-south ch channel of the harbour with the majority on the western side, leaving the eastern side along the edge of the dockyard free to ships to come, for ships to come alongside for heavy lift operations such as steam or remasting and loading can and armaments. Um, the various mooring, moorings incorporate buoys uh, denoted by a symbol of a barrel-shaped buoy floating horizontally 
with no exterior iron bands and a mooring iron on the top. These boys were variously described as swing mooring boys, coaling boys, and halt boys, depending on their location and purpose within the harbour. Um, so each one of these circles is a swinging mooring, so the ship would be attached to a boy in the middle of that, and that is that, that's the purpose of the ship, where the ship could swing according to where the tide was. Um, these are an example of the head and stern bridle moorings. These basically mean the ship can't swing with the tide um, because it's fixed at both ends. Mooring types. A chart from 1840, um, L2334, within the UKHO archive, outlines the infrastructure that existed within, within the harbour, on the harbour bed and landfall points for these moorings, as well as uh, outlining the difference between swinging and head and stern moorings. For both, mooring chains of heavy iron were laid lo along the bed of the harbour. The ends of these were attached to the sediment below by a variety of methods. For the ends uh, that were located on land, a trapezoidal hurdle um, of timber with timber piles in front of each cross piece driven into the earth was used. In the case of the head and stern bridle moorings within the narrow cheek creeks at Porchester Lake and Fountain Lake, both ends of the tidal mooring chains were attached to, to an onshore intertidal hurdle, although some also had anchors due to the hurdles rotting. Um, within the moorings along the sides of the main channel of the harbour, the ends were secured in a variety of ways. Those closest to the western bank had the same hurdle anchor point um, on the onshore end, but the outer end of the chain was fully underwater within the middle of the channel. These wet ends um, were either attached to the harbour bed by double or single shank anchors, as you can see here, um, on a single spot stock or through parks mooring blocks, um, iron blocks of up to seven or eight tonnes with the chain end shackled onto an eye. These are the park mooring blocks here. Um, the opposite end of the parks block had two lugs for lowering them from the surface, presumably from a shipborne davit. Uh, a note on the chart says that the upper mooring, harbour moorings were originally laid across the whole width of the harbour with a hurdle at each end, but during 8, 20, uh, 1826 to 28, these were lifted and relayed water shot, um, so using the parks blocks, possibly due to the hurdles rotting as found in the fountain lake moorings. The parks blocks were used for the vast majority of the wet mooring end, mooring to an end. Although a small number used a large spade style anchor called a hemming, which is this. The mooring chains uh, between these various endings were, of course, very large, with each, with each loop being up to four foot long. These ran along the harbour bed and are likely to have sunk into or been covered by the sediment within the harbour soon after being laid. The two mooring types had two different connections, had different connections between the mooring, main mooring chain that ran along the harbour bed and the bridal chain that were attached to the boys and to ships when they were in place. Swing moorings um, had two bridle uh, pendant chains attached to a single swivel by large shackles that was in turn, um, I think I lost my place. Swing moorings had two bridle pendant chains attached to a single swivel by large sh shackles which was in turn attached to a circular eye rather than a normal chain loop, as seen on the right here. The bridle uh, pendant chains would have been disconnected from the locator boys uh, and attached to onboard bridle chains by large shackles, either through the horse holes at the bow or further aft. The chains were kept off the hull of the ship by chocks. This would have meant the ship would have shut, swung with the chains in tidal flow, hence the dash circles uh, and ovals showing each swinging mooring given the maximum swimming area that ships could be moving through. Head and stern moorings would have been made up of four bridle pendant chains, two aft and two four, shackled to the harbour bed mooring chain four links apart, and attached to bridle chains from the ship through the hawse holes at the bow and the gun room ports at the stern. So that's this picture here. So along the western side of the harbour, the, show, the chart shows a large number of additional buoys with no swing circle labelled as transporting buoys. Um, transporting boy, transporting boy, transporting boy, all the way from along here. Um, these were the system of warping ships in and out of the harbour to avoid having to move un around under sail or from being rowed out. Crew on a ship's boat would row a tow line to the transporting boy and attach it to the mooring ring. The other end would then be turned on the capstan, pulling and or warping the ship towards the boy. Once at that boy, the crew would then row the line to the next transporting boy until they had reached their allotted station. 
A note on the on the chart mentions that this practice, putting a sideways strain on the mooring chains, has caused some of the transporting buoys to be moved from their original charted positions. Um, so here's where we return to the buoy recovered as part of the dredging work. Dredging works for the Queen Elizabeth carrier class car aircraft carriers. As the recovered elements show, it demonstrated to be a heavily reinforced structure able to take impacts of a large size and copper to protect it from long exposure to seawater. It is suspected that it may well be one of these transporting buoys rather than the stand-in mooring buoy, which could be hoisted on board easily to prevent damage. Um, these transporting buoys clearly had to be rugged and strongly built as they were under huge strain as ships walked between them. As a final discussion point, the chart L234 is particularly interesting because as well as containing all of this additional information on mooring infrastructure within the harbour, it has two other odd characteristics. Firstly, it was varnished, um, a very rare treatment for charts which normally need to remain supple to allow them to be rolled and unrolled um, without damaging them. And secondly, each mooring buoy, along with the type of ship it could accommodate, so first rate, um, it's there, frigate, sloop, etc., there's a dotted hull outline um, occasionally doubled. On some of these outlines, small chart paper ships with their names written on have been lightly tacked on with glue. HMS Veteran stands at number 10 sloop, uh, sloop hulk. HMS Sultan and HMS President nestled together on number 22 first rate mooring, while HMS Edinburgh. Uh, and HMS Edinburgh, uh, HMS Edinburgh and HMS Hastings are just upstream. These cutouts are of two colours, khaki green and pale orange. The pale orange ships are in ordinary, um, so they've been at least partly dis dismasted, um, leaving, generally leaving only the lower masts with guns, rigging, spars and stores taken ashore, while the khaki green ships are fully commissioned. Um, the ships in ordinary have also may have also been converted into store hulks, convict hulks, or had their upper decks roofed over as accommodation blocks or training schools. HMS Unicorn, currently berthed at Dundee, is a good example of what a frigate looks like um, when converted into ordinary. HMS Hastings was already in ordinary in 1829 when she was moored on the Medway, according to an etching by E.W. Cook. Because of these attributes of the chart, it's suspected that actually this chart was part of the Edward Day organisation of the harbour during this period either by the captain in use by the captain of the dockyard or by the naval harbour master. The presence of each mooring with all the details of their infrastructure and the capacities of moorings for certain types of ships indicates how important this aspect of managing the dockyard and its associated waterways of the harbour would have been, particularly during a period when large numbers of ships were placed in ordinary after the end of the Napoleonic Wars. Um, that's brought together the last bits of that presentation. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Boscalis Westminster, Roy Haskonen, uh, DIO for their help during the um, works completed. And uh, thanks very much to the staff of the UK HO Archives in Taunton, Portland Museums, the National Archives at Kew and the National Maritime Museum for all their help collecting and, um, the information and um, bringing together the bits of archive material. I'd also like to thank uh, Roberto Mar Marziani, um, Paolo Croker, Graham Scott, Phil Trim, Vicky Lambert, and Andrea Hamill of Coastal Marine and Geomatics at Westlake Archaeology for all their help during this um, study. Thank you very much.